The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in the podcast belong solely to the hosts and not the hosts' past, present, or future employers. Hello, everybody. This is Brian from Breaking Down Security. This week is part two of our discussion with Stacy Cameron and Shannon Noonan on automating all of the things. We have uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, you know what what you should do when you're automating if it's you know makes some sense to automate these processes. Um, you know how you explain to management why you would like to automate these things. So you know we, we continue that discussion this week. Uh, and and for for those of you who are just catching us up new here, we did an uh, an episode with them last week, and it really was just one Twitch stream that we did and kind of split things up. Um, we're still working on how to create the pacing. Obviously, people don't want a, an hour long podcast times two, so we're trying to figure out. Uh, if it's worth the effort to make edits or to keep track of where things are, uh, it may be that we'll just put up 45 minutes on the audio podcast section here. And then if you want to catch the other 30 to 45 minutes, you go check out the Twitch. If you want to catch any other insights that are, that are guests or, um, you know, uh, when we were talking, uh, it might be, might be worth doing that way as well. Um, anyway, so, uh, yes, uh, Stacy and Shannon are, uh, you know, they work for a consultancy that helps organizations with compliance, regulatory, uh, you know, some automation processes. They also, um, you know, make sure that, you know, just that people are, are doing what they need to do. And, you know, so we had them on and yeah, this was a great discussion. We actually uh, got through a lot of the automation portion, I think in this section of the, 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 the stream, uh, we were talking about, uh, some of the pitfalls you get with compliance being a, you know, compliance is, you know, minimum bar for security versus, you know, being secure means often going beyond compliance. So um, I hope I hope you enjoy the audio. I do apologize. It, it sounds like at some points I may be popping a little bit. Uh, my my stream as I was working it out at this time uh, was probably uh, topping out on the end of the, the volume register. So hearing me talk, there might be some clicks or pops or something like that. I do apologize. I cannot fix that post. So I am working on uh, working on getting all that dialed in. I think if you go to our Twitch stream at uh, twitch.tv forward slash breaksec, uh, I, I believe in later streams that we've done that I've done uh, doing things like try hack me and, and, and discussing and, 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 you know, just chatting with other folks. I think we fixed the audio from here on out. So I'm feeling very confident about that. So, uh, hope everyone has a great week. Here's Stacy and Shannon and, uh, have a, uh, you know, be kind and be nice and take care of yourself. Uh, cause you're the only you you have and, um, yeah, have a good week. Right. Right. Um, <clears throat> Okay, but trust so, but verify the big answer to your question. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, you know, the the one thing, you know, and they've probably been burnt by this before. They come in and you give them a ream of paper because that's what we, me and Mr. Betcher may have been guilty of just, you know, inundating the auditors with a bunch of paper that they had to look through and waste their time. So they assumed, well, we gave, they gave us a ream of paper, so they must be true. Um, yeah, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it, it works. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I think in terms of automation, uh, you know, the, the difficulty is to, it's going to take time to get the automation in place. And if you tell your management, Hey, we need to do this. And they're going to be like, well, you have 15 other things you need to do. Why, you know, what, why, 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 why do you want to do this one thing? Um, and I think, I think the, the problem that some of us have, especially uh, maybe not senior personnel who, who don't necessarily understand it is how to frame it in such a way to show cost savings over time. Um, you know, if we can get this, if we can audit 500 boxes with this script, that's not me spending two weeks 
auditing every individual box. And um, I, I think if we could if we could frame it in that way, uh, we we could you know potentially get more automation or you know maybe maybe you could show that it, it is actually cheaper for you to hire a contractor or somebody on short term to come in and make the automation for you or to write the scripts for you. Um, has has that ever been a suggestion that you've given you know uh, clients or anything like that? Yes, I so um, I come from the accounting background, right? I've always dealt with dollars and cents. You got to know your buyer. Who is your buyer and what do they need to know? Half the time your buyers are your CIOs, your CISOs, or the CFO. And they want to see costs go down and more revenue, right? So what, right. what do you have to do? Well, if time is money, I've been on calls, which all of us have, right? This this call right here alone, we're probably about a thousand dollar call right here, just for an hour of our time, right? So if you, if you look at it from that perspective, I'm going to put... <laughs> All right, I'm going to put 20 people on a call for 30 minutes to get them to review something and explain it over and over and over again because it's not automated, it's manual, whatever it is. Well, how much money did that call just cost? That's one right. thing. But it's not going to be one call. It's going to probably be five because the auditors didn't understand it the first time because it's the first time they saw it or they have a new audit team. So expect it to be repeated that time, mid-year, end of year if it's like sarbanes oxley it's all year long you have to prove it pci it's a point in time hipaa it's point in time SOC one SOC two it's all year long so you have your auditors asking all the time the same questions over and over again well I, i'm not explaining it once i'm explaining it five different times that's how much money that's walking out the door so if you can explain that and that's hard because a lot of people don't understand that concept of how much does it cost for my meeting to run because they're not seeing the dollars and cents they're just seeing the bodies in a meeting all those right. soft costs yep 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 and that's just one way then it's all the extra hours outside of that to get that manual job done that nobody's yeah. talking about right they don't show up on a balance sheet so it's 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 like almost hypothetical Right. Yeah. Well, and as you said it, Brian, some of these people in a, in a SOC team, right? Why not automate some of this? Well, they're just so used to doing the routine and getting the job done that they forget to look outside the box and see that there's something else that they could do because they don't know how to do it any other way. They don't know how to pause it because they're being told, I got to get it done now. I have someone to give it to. I have five hours to get it done. It's usually last minute. It's rushed. So it's time and money for them too, because T money t time is money to them right so how much time do they have so that they can get to their kids so if they pause and stop and relook at it what are they missing out at the end of the day is it family is it uh, a life outside of work what is it so if they're used to doing a routine over and over again they forget that well if i simplify this here i may have more time over here they're like no i know how to do this let me get it done now i can get to my life Right. Right. <clears throat> so, all right, you got, y'all work with some big companies, I, I'd imagine. Uh, how important is communication to the automation process? And I work for a big company. Everybody will know the name if I mentioned it, but because of OPSEC, I don't, you know, mention it on the show or I won't hear in the stream. But a lot of times people in my group will be working on something and then find out two weeks later, another group is doing something very similar and uh, there's wasted time and effort there. So uh, it's part of change management, I, I, ideally, because you're, you're, you're wanting to introduce a new process or you want to enter automating a, a specific process. But uh, how important is communicating to people who might benefit from this? Uh, to, you know, so that, that way we're not duplicating effort, you know, and, and, you know, making sure that what works on our side will also work on their side or, you know, to keep from having stovepipe solutions that, you know, uh, only work maybe in a certain way. Yeah, yeah. Stacey, you, go. So you can go ahead. I'll jump in later. <laughs> um, this is my favorite topic ever. Um, especially when I, I'm literally in an organization right now. Finance is doing it one way, legal is doing it another way, and security is doing it another way. And they all have to get to the same goal and none of them are communicating. So then they hire a consultant 
the, uh, say the security IT group will hire a consultant because they have to get it done. They need to see their get their environment sorted out. Legal gets mad because they weren't included. But legal doesn't understand what IT needs to get done because they don't understand the technical piece. And then finance, who's through the internal audit component, is upset because no one told them that IT was doing this. Well, why didn't you all talk before you brought the consultant in? Or why didn't it get communicated? A lot of times it's it's really it's people don't understand what the other teams need to get done and they don't know how to communicate across the lines. So IT speaks one language, legal speaks another language, and finance speaks another language. And none of them know how to communicate the same language. And that may seem really weird, but it's true. Finance talks dollars and cents, legal talks laws, and IT talks technical terms. How do you get them all to speak the same language? And well, they all have a lot of... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Stacey. Oh, no, no. Go ahead. You had a, you're right on it. Go ahead. I'll jump in No, later. it's like they all, they all have the same goal, right? So they should be able to focus on that. I mean, and maybe they would work on the legal side first. And then it's like, well, the next iteration, and we, we talked about this yesterday, uh, pa uh, pa Pastry Death was talking with me about this. Scripts and automation can be an iterative process. So what works, you know, we, we solve the legal problem, then we solve the IT problem, then we solve the security problem or what have you. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, it just seems like you have to know what the goal is or why we're automating this, right? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Stacey. Yeah, so there, um, what I see is it happens when, especially as Shannon was speaking, when you have those different departments um, doing similar um, functions and all using different tools or what have you, are doing it a different way. Um, a lot of those um, stem from not having enterprise processes in place. Um, you'll have, especially like you mentioned, um, change management. I, 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 there's a lot of different ways that people do that. <laughs> um, and um, the ways that I've seen them done the best um, is when they really have all those individuals there, right? The right people there. Maybe they're not all making the decision makers, but at least they have the right people as part of the process. So they have that finance and legal and um, engineering and operational resources. So they all have a chance um, to review those changes. There's also, um, for instance, things that you can do from an enterprise uh, when you're looking at like enterprise architecture um, and what have you, when you have those types of programs in place. Um, and uh, a lot of times you put it through all the way through purchasing or your acquisitions uh, because if they're, you know, if this is how you buy, I always ask people, how can I buy stuff? <laughs> Right. If in your organization, what do I need to do? Do I have to get a purchase order? Do I, do I have to go through acquisitions? Do I have a limit on a credit card that I don't have to go through to bypass any of that? So you get a lot of so when you're trying to really figure that out, always let's follow the money. Right. So that's 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 sort of that that catch all entry port. So then and not people, not too many people think of it, especially when you're looking at a lot of the, the regulations um, that we work with outside of like the financial side, they don't really bring in purchasing. Um, but it's, it's key in certain of those areas when you have all of that within your organizations. I've worked places before um, at a large government organization where they knew this was an issue and they knew they had all these tools. So um, they created a working group just, for, uh, I'll, I'll give an example, for mobile applications. Um, so anyone in that entire organization who wanted to do to, to get a mobile application had to go through that working group that was and it consisted of a lot of security um, folks on, on, on in that working group, small working group. But any mobile application before it could be purchased had to go there for a review. And there was the 80-20 rule. If there's something we already have that's doing 80 percent of what um, of what you need, then we'll work when you're using that and work when using feature requests. So it saves organizations money and time because a lot of times, a lot of these tools that you're working with, um, especially if you're a large enough organization, the vendors are working with you on feature requests and um, you can sort of in, in, incorporate that within your process. But yeah, so I mean, it, it gets very, um, like, and, and it's funny, right? So when they bring like Chance Humble, when you bring that third party in and we come in and we're sitting there and I'm like, and, and it's because, We've had a conversation with this person, that person, and that person. And sometimes you're dealing with internal politics within certain companies. Right. Um, and they actually leverage your auditors or assessors or advisors to come in so they can, they're always excited. Oh, yes, 
we're going to use it. We're going to get on the CIO's calendar. I can never get on his calendar, but I have an auditor here, so I can get on there now. So they'll do that. Or we're going to get on the, we're going to get on the CFO's calendar as well. And then we're going to, these people who never talk to me, we say audit. So they have to um, talk to me. I was doing something for a client before and it wasn't even an audit, but they labeled all the meetings audit. Uh, so, <laughs> and, you know, from, from a compliance person, I'm all, it, it, it just, just a lot, a logic person. It was blowing my mind because I'm very particular. <laughs> <laughs> in an OCD on some of the word usage. I'm like, we're not auditing, we're assessing, but it's totally okay. I was like, I get it. If they show up for that, like people didn't know what they were coming into. It said audit, so they showed up. So I'm like, if that's how your organization works, sometimes you have to to to, to work on that on, on that as well, so. And not only that, they then take it and say, if we find something, they use that as the platform. We'll see, look, I brought an expert in. I brought the SME in and you're like, wait, I, I'm not, they're like, just go with it. Um, and they told me to do this, this, and this. And you have to be so you have to be very careful as you're coming in and making sure that you're not just letting them use you to get their voice out, that they're actually using what you told them to get through the door and not just trying to make their own opinions work. So it's right. an interesting right. perspective on how to get through some of these where they, they take advantage of the assessor and the auditor to get their voice heard. Nice, nice, okay. Nice. Um, so I actually posted up another um, link called kissflow.com and they talked about preparing your automated business processes. And one of the, you know, one of the first things, and I'll, I'll put it in our show notes here. Um, for those of you on the audio podcast, I, I will put all these links in the show notes as well. Um, so the first thing they, they asked about, and that was one of the things I asked about was identifying the process owner and keeping the goal or the why in mind. Um, <clears throat> the other thing they mentioned was get the history, ask the process owner how the workflow was managed in the past. Um, some of the, some of the stuff we've been talking about made me think of my days when I was doing audits for hospitals and our, our consulting firm used the CMMI model, you know, one to five, uh, three being the baseline where everybody should be, where it's like, this is a, you know, they have a process, it's documented and it's easily repeatable by anybody. Um, hospitals rarely made it to level three. It was usually around a one or a two, you know, two being, you know, we have a process, but it's ad hoc. It's not documented. Documentation was like level three, but, um, the, the, get the history that, you know, remember the goal of the automation. Why are you trying to save time, money, tracking items, better reducing paper forms, taking work off of somebody's plate. Don't try to do all of these, just find, you know, pro focus on primary goal or what have you, but ask the process owner how this workflow was managed in the past. Do you, you know, let's say I reach out to a process owner and he's like, I, you know, I don't like, I don't want to, I don't want to automate this process because one, it's going to make me less important or, you know, they, they're going to feel like, you know, they, they don't, you know, have any idea, uh, you know, what, what this is going to do to their job. If they, you know, they believe that this is the one thing they do. Uh, do you ever get any resistance? Cause some of the stuff I learned in ADCAR uh, for change management was, uh, the resistance uh, factor where people are going to be hesitant to make these changes and, and, and automate this. So this is going to generate a lot of resistance. If you're making a lot of changes to people's workflows, how do you manage that? No, I, I thought you were on the front. Yeah, so there, okay, I'll start and I'll let you come in. But um, yeah, so managing um, the politics is fun, right? Um, it's, the, it's the part of consulting that not all consultants get. And that's sort of when you start separating consultant, you know, your consultants out from your, uh, some of your folks that are just spe specifically focused on um, engineering or your um, analytical folks. Um, but um, it's, it's necessary because uh, it just, it's just is within certain organizations. So when they come in and one of the things we like to do and we we're talking about definitely, you know, when you're identifying the process owner, when you're um, um, getting your history and looking at the, the workflow, it's understanding how they're currently doing things um, mm -hmm. and come in and, and, and reassuring them that we're not trying to um, turn upside down what you're doing, but we're trying to optimize and add efficiencies. And the best way to do something like that is really have them work with you for the process. These are actually some of the more fun, I'll say, engagements that I enjoy when I can come in and, you know, we're in person a lot, we'll whiteboard it together. So we come into the conference room, you, you bring in the relevant parties and you really leverage their ideals. Um, and it's a tactic that I use when it's, it's almost like it's their ideal. 
um, and they're suggesting um, that this is the better way to do um, this current task. Um, and someone has to manage the process. Someone has to implement the process. Someone has to make sure that it, it is still ongoing. So when you really show we're not working you out of a job, we're actually making you more efficient with your job and actually allowing uh, um, um, you to even expand and grow because you're now you're adding this automation. It's it's explaining it to it to them as well. So I mean, sometimes you're gonna you're gonna work with different personalities, but when you really sh make it a team effort, then it's not someone came in and didn't like how I did my job um, and decided to change it and said this is what you're going to do. That rarely works. Um, so it's it's more of a let's work together and it's a teaching moment. So I'll, um, we do we teach as well as assess. So if I can teach you a, um, a better way, once I understand your current method, I have to date, I haven't seen, I haven't had the resistance from that. That's good. I, I would imagine, I'd imagine, you know, the, they'll have different work to do. You know, they'll still have to maintain the process. They'll still have to, you know, make sure that the reports are good, uh, that the, the, the automation, you know, generates reports that make sense or have to tweak things so that, yeah, like, like, yeah, it does make sense that, um, I, I, I worry about, you know, uh, the, those folks that just don't want to do that because, you know, maybe they don't like being told what to do or, um, you know, they're, I've, I've had issues with that in the past where people have actually resisted making their jobs easier or, or changing what their job was because they're comfortable in that, in that mold or that, that shoe, if you will. So. And those are the kinds when you actually end up going to the next level, right? Um, yes. So um, a lot of times we're coming in, we're gonna we're, we may be working with the VPs and the C levels um, or what have you, um, and then asking them to assign a leader for said task. And then now, uh, so that's when you kind of leverage those relationships that you've built with that party. Um, and once and, and it happens often. So when I um, work with certain um, individuals. And they're like, I can do this, but I'm not going to do it until my manager says this is what we're going to do. So um, it's great working with them to understand what can be done and then leveraging those executive meetings to say, hey, you have this talent in house. They're just waiting for direction and um, showing it and explaining to them where they're losing money, where they can do more efficiencies. Sometimes it comes in where you're even when you're still leveraging that maturity model or benchmarking um, with other um, industry um, standards or even other um, companies within that same marketplace um, and they can understand what, what people are doing and where they, where they um, end up. Um, so you leverage that um, executive level to help you with that enforce with that enforcement, um, and that's that in those relationships and getting in, that way they're like okay well if management says I can do this then okay and then you then you have that piece of hey you helped de develop this you have helped set your own course so it's not like someone came in and just told you to do something you didn't want to do. Right. So. Okay. Yep. So let's get real. <sighs> Where have you seen this done well? You don't have to name names, but what did they use a tool, right? Did they buy uh, an expensive piece of software and it, and it paid off for them? How much investment did they make? You know, I, I'm going to need some examples here. I've seen it done well. There's certain areas, let's say in the some places that will in the hoteling industry, I've seen certain things done well with leveraging tools. Um, leveraging tools, leveraging um, some of these processes and the, the time when it works the best is if you have somebody that is, uh, you have that continuous monitoring effort. So you're, you have someone that's monitoring these controls or whether it's automated or what have you to make sure that what you put in place is still being done. When it doesn't work is if you just do it once and then come back and check on it the next year and realize it, you only have that that one chance. So where I so see it work, yeah. So I've, I've seen it. I've seen it work um, not as well. I've seen <laughs> I've seen it work semi well. Uh, everyone has a chance to to do it. I've seen things work the best in organizations where they had like a one when they when they actually commit the resources to compliance and security. That's where it works well. Not places I go in and there's no compliance department because I've done that as well. Mm. So well, and, and, that's, that's usually and, when we never end up leaving too. <laughs> Good for business. 
<laughs> so you're saying that they actually need an engineer on staff in the compliance, maybe in the compliance department or dedicated to maybe not dedicated, but dedicate hours to keeping this automation um, flowing, right? Yes so. and no. Yes and no on that. It You need the right partnerships. So I worked, and actually with Stacy, we worked with an organization that we were able to work with teams and we partnered with them properly that they were able to do certain tasks. They understood the reason why it needed to get done. They understood the purpose behind it and they understood that it was gonna make their lives better. So they worked with us. If you don't have the right partnerships, then yes, I could see an engineer need to be on your team. But if you have the right partnerships with the teams and you can help, and you can be a priority because think of it, if you don't own it, right? And this is where we all see this in security. You have these teams, the CISOs, that are telling all these teams to do these things. And then they're like, well, why aren't you getting it done? Like, I don't own the people to get it done. So how am I supposed to implement something if I don't have the team to get it done? I have to rely on you to do the work. So really you own it. But their priority list is not the CISO's priority list. Their priority list is whatever their boss is telling them to do. And if it never gets involved or in tune to what needs to get done, you're never going to get done. So you need to make sure your buyers or upper management, just Stacey was saying, someone is making you a priority and partnering with you to get something done. Otherwise, you need the teams to get the work done yourself. Communication. So that's um, that communication across all departments, whether they're um, assigned to the team or just assigned as a resource to communicate with to make sure that you really understand what's going on. So you have that communication. You have that executive. Um, you have that executive leadership and executive support. Um, and then you have somebody that is actually designated and assigned as those process owners. Um, so, um, yeah, I literally went somewhere and I might even going to say, where I was, but there was someone who didn't didn't own um, a very large security part of their uh, <laughs> of what they did, and I found that interesting that there was no owner at the time. They they have one now, but um, those, those those types of things uh, things get lost if there's no one um, wanting to be responsible for it, they'll get lost. So right. you don't necessarily have to have them on the team, but you definitely need to talk to them. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is there yeah. a guide or a cheat sheet or something like I'm in? Uh, I I deal a lot with Windows logging and there's actually something online called the Windows logging cheat sheet, right? So is there a Every time. compliance automation cheat sheet? Is there a um, you know, change management automation cheat sheet out there? Like, I, I don't know where to get started. Yeah, a lot of times, um, especially if you're, if you're thinking from a compliance standpoint and you have that particular regulation, um, you can find a lot of checklists, I would say, uh, that at least will get you started. Um, so you can, it almost gives you an initial um, assessment so you can look at With your automation own in mind though? No, that's not gonna have automation in mind. So um, I have not seen something that has automation in mind. I've seen it um, separate, right? So if you're talking about change management, there's gonna be a whole bunch of things to talk about automation there. If you're talking about IAM solutions, there's gonna be um, um, automation there. If you're talking about things like SIM um, or centralized event management type things, there's going to be automation there. I have not seen one collaborative list or comprehensive list that says this is automating everything. Oh. And that also gets back to is everyone has a favorite tool. So you're going to have yeah. one compliance team say that they like all these tools and you're going to have one engineering team that say they like all these tools. So it's very difficult to get yeah. that one list because everyone uses a different Tool, scanner. I see it from an MSSP standpoint, our managed service providers, um, they all give you a one-stop shop. Yep. Yep. It's The, the solution is going to be fairly bespoke, right? Every every group is going to have their own way of doing something. Uh, un unless you're, you know, leveraging some kind of automation platform that everybody uses, but it would seem to me it'd be a very bespoke kind of solution depending on what your what your company is. And every company is going to be different, I, I would imagine. So Yeah. Well, it, would, C, it would seem C, then if that's I the case, and not. Yep, <laughs> that it might be worth it to get someone on staff that that may be good at automation or has done it in the past and you hire them, maybe even a contractor for six months or whatnot right. to come in and <clears throat> figure out all the processes that you have in on your G, GRC team and 
and just let them go and automate as much as they can, right? And and let them do what they do. Um, it might be uh, money well spent because if they start automating half of the work that's out there, and you can just you know, choose your own adventure. Well, I'm you know I'm making the choices, but all the reading, all the time, right? In between the beginning and the end of the chapter is all like takes a second, right? And so yep. um, I, I think it might be money well spent depending on your organization to hire a consultant or somebody that's good at automation, that's good at uh, assessing what you might um, find uh, valuable in um, you know, repeatable tasks. Absolutely. We, I agree. I agree yep. with we, that. We, we got developers, developers and security people are kings of automating things. We, we talked about this earlier. You know, we, we don't, we don't, we don't want to have to, you know, type commands in lazy. continuously. So no, no, no. We're efficient workers. We're not lazy. <laughs> We're not lazy. There's a difference. <laughs> Um, yeah, they simplify. Yeah, so, they yeah. simplify. They make it we're easy. simplifiers. Yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> they have so, an easy red button. <laughs> that's right. So uh, we had a we had a comment from Pastry Death in our chat uh, about uh, the contact stuff. He said when I was, or when they said when I was in corporate training, we had a concept called hourglass. All the people on the ground had a single point of contact, and that point of contact relayed the information to the proper managers and vice versa. That single point of contact held the knowledge and therefore could make decisions about the whole picture instead of getting redundant issues. Um, and he, uh, uh, Pastry also said, I feel like automation is also something that needs to that needs its own group of maintainers. I hear a lot of horror stories about technical debt, uh, juniors getting put on legacy code that they don't understand what is going on. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, automation needs to be updated. It's just like code, right? So, you know, we can't, if it gets stale or, you know, maybe it needs to be updated, you know, some of these things like Python scripts will use dependencies that go, you know, out of, out of date, or, you know, if you're using a script in Python two and it needed to be migrated to Python three, your automation is going to suffer if you can't, you know, migrate that and you're going to have to create something from scratch. So, um, yeah, good, good call outs there, pastry. Um, it's also important from a management perspective to realize it's not always okay to give somebody more tasks than just than that just because they've simplified their job. That's correct. But um, you know, uh, Shannon and and Stacy were you you mentioned having somebody who could be a point of contact for those things. Um, I see it a lot in my at an or, my organization and other organizations in the past where we end up with the and title. So I'm the lead developer and I'm also doing collateral duties. And so I'm working 40, 50 hours a week as the developer over here. And now I have to do another 10 to 15 hours. Um, do, I mean, is that is that a is that a culture thing? So if we have somebody who's dedicated to updating these things, uh, you know, I mean, it's it's a rhetorical question. They should be doing this, but I mean, um, do you ever make recommendations like, "Hey, look, you can't be having this person working fifty hours and also trying to do this. This is a legitimate mm -hmm. job that needs to have a JD connected to it. It needs to have a dedicated asset." Have you ever gone in and said, "Hey, you've got too much to do to have automation being a secondary task"? Yeah, we've I've done that directly to. Um... Um, I actually, I usually say it to their face, right? <laughs> uh, uh, I, I've looked one that's going out of face. I said, you are a risk to your organization. Uh, I was on a risk assessment. So I'm like, FYI, you're going in the report as a risk. Yep. Uh, and, and he was okay with it. Like, I, I didn't want to shock him with it. I didn't want to deliver a report. But I'm like, you're going in there as a risk because you are one, you're a single point of failure. Um, and yeah. you're, he was a, a senior level. And I mean, your job is to um, go out, find these technologies, get all this automation in place. Um, but you're coming in every, every day and you're sitting here and looking at audit logs. I'm like, uh, you should have people that do that. And you have people here that can. So, I mean, but it was the, the beauty of that is coming back in the next year, it was fixed, right? There was a new, new personnel was hired. Um, his, 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 his um, duties were shifted to focus on, he was a CISO, to focus on his CISO task um, a lot more. Uh, and I saw, like, I love when I go someplace and they've made changes in a year. It's it. I like. I just want to hug people, you know, pre-pandemic time. Um, but <laughs> but um, it's 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 it was 
it was a beauty for that. So coming in the next year, I can actually, I, I'll give you credit for, yes, you are you are doing these things. This says something about your organization. It says that your organization has management is listening, management is, is actively um, working. So you're reducing your overall overall risk um, within, within your organization because you're actually managing it. So, you know, if you have, everyone has risk. If you, if you don't manage them, then as an organization, you're higher risk than someone who has those same risks, but they are managing them. So when you look at the big picture, you're going to see this one's going to have, they're going to look better in a risk perspective because they're actually managing these risks. So those, those are, those, those are the types of things. And um, yeah, so yes, you need to look at these things. You need to do them. And um, we, we, we see it, we see it work. We see it, we see it fail. And we usually try to learn from all those experiences and help our clients out. We're just here to help. Right. Well, as Stacey's saying, the big areas we see this is when we come in and do a risk assessment for the company. And we, we're looking at risk assessment identifies people. My favorite is when we do business disaster, business continuity disaster recovery. And you start saying, all right, so who are your key points of failure? And if this were to go down, is anyone able to support you if you can't get to it? And they're like, no, I'm the only person that knows how to do this. Immediately, it highlights the gap and the risk that's associated. And you just sit there and say, so is management ready to hear the fact that this is not gonna work if all of a sudden something goes wrong? Um, but those are like the two big areas that we see it, as well as other gap assessments that we do. But it's amazing how many times we come across it. Right, yeah. Yeah, uh, there, there are far too many single points of failure in, in organizations. And, you know, it, it kind of creeps up on you over time. You don't realize until, you know, you've had complete turnover in a department and you're like, well, he's been here two years. He's the, you know, or, or she's been here the longest. So, she, you know, she should, she knows how to do all this stuff. And who else does? Well, no, nobody really. And how long has it been since we updated the automation documentation or, how you know, regular process documentation? Well, we, we haven't. So, um, you know, that, that's probably a compliance finding, like, you know, but bumping, bumping the versions on your, your policies and procedures and everything is a, is a, is a regular, yeah. uh, thing that you have to do. But, um, so the tools, the tools may be different depending on every company, but is there any good, um, uh, way or any good format that you've ever seen, uh, the documentation, for, for processes or, or automation? Because one of the, the eight things they say here in the list is uh, you should, you know, document, you know, the, the process or the workflow. And, and when you're gathering the data about the unautomated process, when you're diagramming the workflow, is there any good, I mean, is it is it better to be visual? Is it better to have just a, you know, a, a sheet of paper with words on it? I mean, what, what works best for people? Know is your it, audience. Is it, know your audience? Okay. Know your okay. audience. I've seen people that, um, granted, no one really likes to read a document. They usually like flow charts because if you're working with developers, they want to see the flow. They want to understand the flow. Right. They don't want right. to read a bunch of words. Um, they want the guidance and they want to be told what to do and they want to understand the flow. Whereas you get your business process owners and they don't understand those diagrams. Um, they get confused and they're like, what, why, do, why is there all, what, what's going on? What are these boxes? What, what's going on here? They like the words. So who, right. who's your right. audience and who are you trying to communicate with? Um, and sometimes having both actually is beneficial because. I was going to say both, yep. <laughs> both because you have, as we said this, you have multiple teams you're communicating with. Well, what's the language that they need to speak? And how do you centralize it and simplify it? Well, sometimes it ends up being both because you've got to, get the message and communication across multiple layers. Yeah, wherever, whatever you do, just make sure you have a, a central repository where all the documentation is going. That's mm -hmm. the one that I see it's critical. Um, for instance, especially if people are using like Confluence and Jira or whatever wikis that you're using, um, it's, it's a good tool because if I have a new person that's starting, um, you, we were talking about this a little earlier, you, they jump in, they go, they're, they're creating a new, we'll say widget. <laughs> they're creating a new widget. Um, they go into the widget creation page and it tells me, um, I love if they've decided what languages that we're going to use or if we're doing, we're going to use this for this. This is the process. This is how we're, we're going to comment and code or what have you. Um, and this is the whole workflow that we're going to do. Um, so they have that. My thing is making sure whatever you document, as Shannon was saying, on your audits, make, make, make it usable. Um, and unfortunately, when you work with 
auditors, you don't always get that piece. They, they just want to see things from an audit standpoint. Um, but the thing is, when you make the documentation usable, the auditors can use that same information. But if you ask them, they're not going to tell you that. So you want to make sure that whatever you're doing, it's usable. If I have a team that's just working with widgets, then I only need this wiki for my, my widget my widget team. Um, auditors, you can just combine, like you said, we gave them all the information. You can combine the information and they can get it. But you want to focus, when you're focused on documentation, it needs to be in a usable format. So if it's a process, um, an overarching management process where, you know, your engineering team doesn't need to get to the the, the, the details of it, then you can write it write it as, as such. But then, you know, they have that repository where everything is. And you can use as a reference, you know, from someone that was doing things, you I would go in and search our policies. How do we do this? What is what is what 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 is our stance on on VPNs if you're managing a VPN solution? You want to make sure that you can just go and easily look up that information. So um, yeah, so I would I mean short, sweet to the point is the best way to do it. Um, Confusing auditor, sure, give them long enough for fresh fish. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I, I feel, I feel but they just bad. Know they're going to ask you questions. If they read it, they're going to ask you questions, and now you have to go read the document you gave them. <laughs> well, see, if I have it in eight point, if I have it in eight point font, then it will take them forever to read it. And you know, you know. zoom right in, they'll zoom right in. It's the pronouns no longer exist. They zoom right in. That's true. And the best That's is true. when the best is when someone takes a generic policy that doesn't meet what they're doing, and they give it to the auditors, and then the auditors go, "So your password policy says that you're going to have eight characters, alphanumeric." But you're configured to have, a, a, and this is not happening, six characters and only numbers? <laughs> Why are you not meeting your policy? And they're like, crap, did anyone read this before we get to the office? <laughs> My my favorite was going and auditing hospitals, and I'd be like, "Well, we need we need an incident response plan." And they're like, "Oh, that's not in that. Let me let me get back to you and <laughs> give it a couple of days." And I was like, "Look, you you don't Google. have the document. You can't give me a document in two days and have the actual active date being yesterday." So they implemented you know, it overnight. <laughs> did did they? Did they see the problem was I I was coming in to do the pre audit I was not the actual auditor I was the guy coming in to help them but they they always treated me like I was the enemy and I was like look I'm just trying to help you find what work you need to do so if you don't have an IR policy just just tell me we'll mark it down as a thing to do don't try to you know sandbag me for two days and then have something you know like like what Stacy said really generic policy or you know uh, like Shan said st generic policy you know, with no real teeth in it because you weren't enacting this. The policy is great. The process is great, but you actually haven't tested it. You haven't done anything with it. You don't know how it's going to screw up your system. So, well, yeah. And that goes back to your, that's a great point you just raised, is the fear of any form of an auditor or assessor coming into insight. You, we usually go in, we have to literally say, guys, we are part of your team. We will help you become successful. If you give us the information, if you hide it from us, we can't help you be successful and make sure you get through the door the right way. And it's amazing how many people fight that because they're so afraid that someone's gonna say there's an issue and that they're gonna have a repercussion down the, down the pipeline. So it's that top-down approach of how do you communicate to them and get them to understand that you're part of the team and you're going to make them successful versus that you're just going to highlight all of their flaws. Yep. yep. I usually start with the first statement, come in. So I'm not your auditor this time. I'm on your side. We're on the same team. Um, matter of fact, we're going to help your audit be easier, but you have to tell me everything. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so we we're on the same me. team. Yeah. Yes. So you got to come in and establish that trust first. And then like, this is what we're going to do. And um, usually, you know, it's, it's a really good response of like, we want to figure out, we, like, we want to air all our dirty laundry now before we get to the auditor. So I've gone places, especially you get someone they already know to say, yes, tell them everything. And there's a flood of information. And I'm just like, okay. Yep. But and then in certain places, you know, they're, they're warming up, they're coming up, coming slowly, slowly, but surely, but they're able to do, but I'm like, I always tell them it's that. And then, you know, we have that shared enemy, which is the regulator. Right. So uh, right. I'm like, yeah, let's, let's be mad at PCI together. Why are they making you do this? And you know, we're, we're going to be mad. We're going to be the same team. We're going we're gonna to blame them for everything. Like, I, I wouldn't, you know, I'm not telling you to do this, but the standard says, so we got, you know, they're going to come back. 
they're gonna come back and ring you for this. So we better do this. Yo. They'll be our enemy. <laughs> so um one of one of the things i think shannon asked me was uh do we have leeway to discuss other issues or difficulties uh you know in terms of of compliance and change management and, um yeah your your discussion there with the eight characters and the you know the upper lower number special and some of the issues that we've had uh, with pci M- mr betcher and myself have been something a uh, legendary um i i actually think pci hopefully is moving in the right direction on this but uh, do you ever, from a compliance point of view, uh, worry that compliance is lower than actual security? Because that our, our our thoughts, well, at least my thoughts, were I don't know, Mr. Bretcher can echo this. Was I always strived for higher than compliance? Because compliance is like here, here, damn you, overlay, and then like security's up here. So PCI is like eight characters, upper, lower, number, special, and it's like, no, we should be doing better than that. We should get rid of the eight character thing. Just make it, you know, an absolute minimum, but we should encourage our users to be secure, not to be compliant. Uh, is, do you, either of you have you thoughts on this? I'll start with Stacey. You are speaking my language now. Okay, so. Um. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you listening, we did a hair flip. All right. Okay. So- <laughs> I would do it, but my ear, my earbuds would fall into the ground. So, <laughs> so compliance and security, always something there, not the same thing. You can be compliant and not secure. You can be secure and not compliant. Compliance came for accountability purposes. People were just oh. out here, wild, wild westing, doing whatever, not taking the right security precautions. So compliance decided to come in and say, let's give some parameters, right? Um, but we want things that, you know, you're going to hold people to the standard. In some cases, you're going to cut off um, services or you're going to find, find them. So they had to come up with something that's kind of doable what, while people can put these in. And what a lot of people forget or what they don't notice is most of your compliance regulations, they add that risk assessment piece, right? And that risk assessment piece gets glossed over, or glazed over so many times that people don't understand how important that is. That risk assessment piece is the piece that if you do it correctly, will let you know where or which areas from that compliance framework, do you turn it up a notch, right? So, um, you know, we, the majority of your information may be confidential or, or, or sensitive, or you have a lot of different systems or what have you, um, and you're saying this password required, this minimum is just not gonna cut it. Or, or research has come out that and now your compliance standards are outdated so you need to make those corrections from a security standpoint um always tell people compliant if you're going to be more secure but uh it is different than your compliance um requirement then you should be okay because that's what they want you to do but there are certain standards where it's like it's got to be done this or it's wrong and if it's wrong you're not compliant you're not going to get this so those are the ones where you really have to look at carefully um Case in point, I'll, um, I'll perfect example of from the federal side, um, you have to use for encryption, you're using FIPS 140 2. So a lot of people were using um, Open SSL, it had its FIPS um, accreditation or validation, and then there was an update. Well, the update wasn't validated, but it was improved and it was <laughs> the more secure version to use. So um, it was a matter of, you know, um, federal entities recognizing, yes, this is more secure. So we're going to have to go through our process to accept it. But if you don't know that's a process, if you don't know that's there, then you're sitting there at an impasse talking about, I want to be secure but I have to turn it down to be compliant. It right. just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. So I'm, I'm totally with you on that. And I do, and I see PCI, like you're saying, PCI is improving with that and some other regulations are, and they're really starting to under understand those, those aspects of it in later controls. Right. Well, and also right. comes back to it. The compliance is a baseline. It's not meaning you're secure. It's the baseline to get people to be secure. Cause I, and I know Stacey, you've run into this is people want to just check the box. Let me just say it's done. And I'm not going to say anything else. I just need to pass this and I just need a report so that I can get to the next day. And I don't want to do anything else. Well, then they're never going to be a secure environment then. They don't want it at that point. So if you can't get them to get beyond it and beyond a checkbox activity, you're never going to see anything else anyway. So it's all about how you educate them and get to understand how do you get to a secure environment so that you can be compliant at the same time. 
Right. That's interesting. Uh, secure, but not compliant. Uh, just looking at the password. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of examples, but just look at the passwords for, for example. Um, if I say, well, you can have anything. You don't have to have a number. You don't have to have a special. You don't have to have uppercase. Just 20 characters. You know, mathematically, that may be better than a 10 character upper lower number special, right? So and there are studies that support that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I can see that secure but not compliant aspect. So, is there any leeway in these compliance frameworks for the auditor to go, you know what? I did the math, you know, so prob uh, probability wise, you, you're better than the compliance framework. So I'm going to pass you on the password. Uh, yeah. So policy. there's some, right. There's leeway there. Um, a lot of times within the compliance, um, frameworks, you still have to write something up as a compensating control. If you're doing like PCI or mm -hmm. an alternative implementation. Um, and then you have sort of that, for instance, the funny thing is, um, from from a federal standpoint, you have your NIST um, SP your SP eight hundred dash fifty three, and you have controls uh, that um, contradict other NIST studies, and especially yeah. specifically yeah. passwords, right? Um, so it's very interesting when you go someplace where they're like, okay, we're using this, but this also from this says I don't have to expire at this time, and I can use this length, and I don't have to use complexity. So those types or of things. Factor authentication, you know. So yeah. right. So we have that, and so then you look at that, and you're like, okay, well, you're citing this study, you're doing this, and we'll just because it's a compliance area, you have to write it up a certain way, whether it's a risk exception or um, a compensating control. So there is a process that you follow that you do that um also explaining it to the auditor so not all some not all auditors are built the same um so sometimes you have to really explain and, and some of them will fight you tooth and nail i mean i had an example um with a pci so i was a pci qsa and there was another but i was you know on team team vendor <laughs> and then the uh, there was another qsa um really asking the vendor to do things that just didn't make any sense mm -hmm. and they were putting so much on them and you're talking about resources and level of effort and money that was outside of pci compliance but there's that what there's that area with when pci if the qs if the qsa won't sign off on it then you're gonna have a problem so we had to have a i would say a a, a meeting with just me and the other one because nobody else wanted to meet with them. And so we met and I was like, hey, start the meeting. I'm meeting with you because nobody wants to meet with you. I'm, I'm, I'm a straight shooter, right? <laughs> so um, it's like, it's nothing personal, but let's have this conversation. Um, and by the end of that, I think it was probably an hour long conversation. Um, and we ended up agreeing to, well, we didn't really agree to disagree. We just disagreed um, on the method. And probably like a day or two later, he uh, quit the contract. So um, <laughs> um, it worked out for the client because now they were previously contractually obligated, but since the the um, um, the vendor wanted out of their their contract, they, they were able to get another vendor that understood it a little better. So um, you really, it, I don't like to do things like that, but I like to make sure that we have an understanding and I can understand things from an auditor perspective, but I also understand that from a technical and security perspective as well. And, and that's when you it really sort of gets under my skin when you're, when they're focused on just what it says from a compliance standpoint, and you're ignoring security, because right. that is the nature of it. Yeah. So, so what's worse, the, the, the vendor or the, the, the company that's not following PCI requirements or the PCI auditor who comes in who uh, can't see past the PCI wording and like, you know, it has to be done my way or the highway or you're, you know, it's, it's a failure thing. Do you ever, do you ever find somebody and maybe, maybe, you know, you've run into this with, with other groups, maybe some of the big four folks uh, where they are unwilling to budge on exactly how to do something. You, you feel that the company has, you know, satisfied that requirement, but big four or whoever believes, no, it needs to be done this way. Uh, is, is I've lost one fight. I've lost one fight. Really? <laughs> really? I've lost one fight. It wasn't a bad one, but it was, um, 
um, it, it ended up being a checkbox thing. I hate checkboxes. Uh, um, so, I mean, it wasn't worth the, this. You look at it, it's not worth it. It wasn't like a huge money, um, money pit or anything like that. Oh, it was, it was a, it was, it was a checkbox thing where it's like create a document that's not going to be used. Um, and it goes back to when I say, when I do things, I want to make sure everyone's using things that is usable information that you're not just doing things to do things. But, um, I mean, in the end of it, you need to get through the audit. So (laughs) they didn't want to budge on one document. So I gave them a document that was not relative to the boundary whatsoever. And I told them it's not relative to the boundary and they were okay with it. And they're like, that's fine. We just checked in this box. And I was like, this is dumb, but okay. (laughs) I literally have meetings every single day with auditors and they go, why are you doing this? what is the reasoning and they'll say because my boss told me to do it right and you then you have to go back to educating them say this is why you don't need to do it and here's all the reasons why this is accomplishing your goal and a lot of times you're getting auditors especially in like the big four not dogging the big four because i came from that but that don't you're getting someone right out of college that's being told to do x y and z and they're following the prior year work papers versus evolving with technology evolving with the industry evolving with standards and looking at it from a different perspective so as these organizations change and improve themselves they have to go back to a team and explain that improvement and explain why it's better what did it do to improve and then you have to reteach the auditors because they're not learning this all the time some are right when you get a good auditor you get a great you 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 hold on to them for life um but that's also why Stacey and i are in the position we are we went out on our own because we wanted to help organizations because we were seeing this and we we knew that organizations needed this help because they are living in a world where they have to reteach re-explain and they need someone to simplify it for them to get through the auditors and sometimes right. they just don't even know how to speak to the auditor Right. And sometimes the auditors, they all, they they mean well, they're just trying to get things done a certain way, but it's that communication, right? You're coming to an environment that you may, if it's your first time, once you become the repeat auditor, you kind of understand the environment. But if it's your first time coming in there, you just don't understand. And there's not enough time within an audit period to understand some of these very extremely complex systems. So um, that's why we're able to come in and sort of help out. We can speak the auditor talk and we can translate. And you say, they ask for this. I'm like, well, this is what they're talking and this is what you do. And and we can translate both sides. And a lot of times it's very um, appreciative. We're, we don't, we're not coming in there with a chance. We're going to fight with your auditors. And we, no, we want to get you through the process. That's what we want to do. But we don't want you to be asked to do things that don't make sense. We don't want you to have to change, like you talked about, up in processes altogether, um, just to meet a standard when there's another alternative that may be more beneficial to the organization. But you have to understand the environment for that, and you have to understand um, the audit framework. So those types of things is we just, like I said, we're trying to come in and help. Um, We don't mind discussing things with auditors. Sometimes you get someone that's new, so and they appreciate that it's all about how you approach it. We're not going to come in like we know more than you or what have you, or, you know, we don't want you going against what your boss told you to do, but we're going to ask the questions because that's what, that's what we owe our clients is to ask the right, cl- the right questions. And if we, it's a, and it's a meeting with your boss that we need to have, it's a meeting with your boss that we will have. Um, so it's, it's, it's nothing new, right? We, those are, we, we work with all it's a healthy, levels. healthy way to push back, healthy way to push back. Nice. Yes. Yep. M- Mr. Betcher, do you remember the time we were in our PCI audit and two people showed up and they were taking their laptops out of their brand new Dell cardboard boxes? Yeah, they were. Uh, <laughs> they were peeling the little plastic off of their screen, right? Like for the first day time. one, man. Day one, and I was like, oh, that doesn't inspire confidence. Uh, you know, well, and we, we weren't were no small ass shops. Like, okay, this yeah. is going to be a breeze. Yeah, we were no small ass company. I mean, and they sent us, you know, noobs, and and we're like. Oh, great. Okay. You know, and I get it. They got to start somewhere, but Jesus. Not here. Right. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Or, or at least do that in the car. Like, there's going to be some bad. <laughs> bad, yeah. bad. You see, it was two of them. You were going to be the training and educators that day? Pretty much. <laughs> Trial by fire. Yeah. We we were basically telling them, you know, what how to do things. And, and it was two of them, and both were brand new. And there was no, like, uh, team lead that was experienced or anything. So... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I've got a I've got a great story that you guys will appreciate. And I don't know if I've ever told you this, Stacey. So I was 
um, visiting my parents for dinner and my dad just came in from work. He was an IT director at some large company and he just looked at me and goes, I hate your kind. And I go, what did I do wrong this week? <laughs> like, which kind? He goes, auditors, none of you know anything. You're all a bunch of idiots. And I was like, okay, what did I do wrong now in my life? He goes, so let me tell you a story. And he goes, I had these auditors ask for all of this documentation. And then I read, read their scripts and all their scripts are wrong. So I rewrote their scripts for them so I could pull all the right information that they really needed. And then they lost all the information I gave because this was like probably 15 years ago and they were pumping everything on a CD or printing it out and they lost the CDs. And he goes, and you know what they did today? They sent me the intern in and I lost it because they didn't have the ability to face me when they lost my information and I had to teach them and I had to rewrite all of it. The best part is, 10 years later, I went and worked with that team. And I realized when I walked in the room and I said, oh, it's all of you guys that my, my dad was talking about. And I didn't tell them, but I was like, oh, I go home, I go to dinner the next day. And I was like, so I met the team that you told me about 10 years ago. Yeah, they haven't changed. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. Pastry chef, he, he's uh, the pastry. I, sorry about uh, if I'm using the right, I hope I'm using the right pronouns. It, it says, I bet they're all grizzled veterans now. Yeah, that was about, I would say, yeah, seven, eight years ago. So they've gone through probably several hundred of these engagements now. So they're probably old hat at this now. So, but yeah, you know, everybody has to start somewhere. It was just unfortunate that they had to start with us. But actually, it's probably good they started with us because we didn't put up a huge fuss about them coming in. We were like, we did rate, we did raise a question, but we didn't. You know, I, I have heard people say, uh, I would have sent them back. I would have sent them home. I would have sent them away and, and said, come back with legitimate people. So we didn't actually do that. We were, actually, I think we were actually quite um, kind to them. I, th I remember us and Bobby was, was, was quite uh, nice to them. So anyway, well, so we, we were, uh, we were able to persuade them to, uh, you know, give us a good score or whatnot. Right. <laughs> so if you didn't yeah. have anyone experience, they would be our, you know, they wouldn't know what was the right answer and the wrong answer on, right. on a lot of things. So right. when you give them a document, they're like, oh, okay. I've never seen a document like this before. This looks pretty good, I guess, right? Yep. And and it saves us having- Also try rum cake for audits. I bring rum cake. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was it's about to say- true. I was about to say we didn't have to give them that extra suitcase full of money then, you know, but I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's why we have the disclaimer on the podcast. Yeah. Um, yeah. Feed your um, auditors and don't let them leave the room. I've definitely right. done a few of those audits where we, we just did breakfast, lunch, and dinner in the room. And we just went from meeting to meeting. And by the end of the week, they're just like, okay, what? no more. I can't do any more information. I'm on overload. Stop. I go, well, we got three more meetings today. It's Friday. We, we can do this, right? Right. Yep. Yeah. They, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's a, it's a slog. I would imagine being, uh, especially for one of the big four. I mean, they, you know, it is what it is. So, oh, oh my goodness. We, we've managed to burn almost two hours. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I think we did about 10 minutes of, of, you know, welcome, but I mean, we're, we're doing pretty good. So, um, we, we're very vendor agnostic here on That's the show. We time. don't, yeah, it's about that time. Yeah, we've got to be getting. So uh, we're vendor agnostic on the show. We, we don't, uh, you know, we, we do take sponsors, but, uh, um, you know, uh, Shannon, Stacy, you work for a consultancy that does something similar. Uh, you know, I, I'd love for you to give your, your elevator pitch if uh, you, you know, before we go about if somebody's looking for somebody to help with pre-audits or automation or what have you, um, maybe you could tell people a little bit about what you do there. Me or you first? <laughs> you, ma'am. <laughs> it's my turn. Um, so yeah, so we are QoS Consulting Solutions and um, we help organizations do many things around audits, compliance, security, um, everything from assessing your environment and helping you find the right tools or identify the tools that you currently have in place to improve upon. Um, so it, it's a not necessarily um, recreating the wheel but looking at what you have in place and improving it or helping you identify the right tool that's going to make your environment more efficient so we take our experience our exposure and we, we try to improve upon that so we do everything from gap assessments risk assessments security design architect so 
you name Very it, cool. we're there. Yeah, and okay. we work with most of your regulations, anything that has an IT security component, because uh, I always tell people compliance is broad. You know, there's a compliance standard on peanut butter. So, <laughs> so we, while we don't know, we won't help you with that, but we can help you for anything that has an IT security component, which will um, fall within privacy sector as well. So you have your GDPR, your CCPAs, your um, ISO standards, um, you have FedRAMP, we have your DOD, RMF, we have HIPAA, we have Sar Sarbanes-Oxley, so then you have, and then you have SOC, um, so on the financial sector, so we can help help you with those as well, and of course, PCI, DSS, um, we partner with other companies, for instance, if it's something that requires a particular um, auditor designation, like QSA, um, we partner with QSA companies when needed, um, and um, we everything that we do, we can also train your organization on as well. So um, a lot of times um, what we'll do is we'll bring people in for like staff augmentation um, and it allows the organization to work within their own growth plan, right? So they can have, you know, part-time staff that comes in just to do these functions that, that you're not seeing that's needed on a day-to-day -day basis. So just sort of do it as, as needed and it allows you to budget while you figure out what you want to do from a compliance standpoint. And then whenever you bring your, your, your new staff in, they work alongside mm -hmm. our folks that have been there and they're able to sort of come up to speed and just really train them on the organization. And then there's other organizations that reorg um, and, you know, you'll get an engineer and then now this engineer is going to be compliance or something like that or what have you. And they're still learning. Maybe they're learning GRC. I've had, we've had clients come in and say, can you help us? We have a GR we now have a GRC team. Can you help our GRC program? Um, mm -hmm. So we will help um, build out information security programs as well. Um, okay. So yes, so we can help a, a lot of different aspects. And again, we're here to help. We want to have a little fun with it. We don't want compliance to be the dirty word, but we also want it to work with security. So while compliance and security are not the same, they should go hand in hand. They should work together. Right on. Okay. Uh, you can tell she communicates for a living. I'm over here going like, uh, yeah. I, I, can do I the under, hair slip now. I've been here. I've been here for 15 years at least, so I, I understand GDPR, FedRAMP, you know, all of those, uh, the dits cap, die cap stuff used to be my bag. Uh, so, kind of definitely understand. So, uh, they can also, uh, you can also uh, check them out at uh, www.qosconsultingsolutions.com. I put a link in the stream chat, and I'll put it in the show notes as well. Um, and uh, your Twitter handle, I believe, is uh, let me scroll up in the Zoom chat. Now I have I, Solutions QOS is on Twitter. Right. So okay, okay, and um, both of you are on on LinkedIn uh, uh, as well. So uh, there and you ourselves, go. yep, yep, cool, <laughs> cool. yeah. Uh, well, I I, I know I, people who aren't. <laughs> yeah, I found I found y'all on LinkedIn because I put a post in LinkedIn. I was like, hey, we're going live. We're going to be talking to to Shannon and Stacy. So boom. Ah. Um, so yeah. Um, Cool. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you both for coming uh, today. Uh, we're going to finish up the show. If you want to hang around, that's fine. Uh, if you want to, you know, drop off, that's, that's fine too. But uh, thank you both for your time. Uh, you know, we'd love to have you both back on uh, and, you know, about anything. If you, you know, come up with a blog post or you have some interesting, you know, more stories from the trenches, we'd love to have you on because, you know, Twitch is Twitch, and there's a lot of folks out there that would love to hear some, you know, Schadenfreude about. Thank God that's not my company. Uh, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, Brian's plural for, for having for having us. This has been really great. Um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. No problem. Thank you very much. Excellent. Glad, All right. We have that mutual friend that told us we need to talk about that thing. Hey, yeah, you know what? I'm glad he did that. And, uh, you know, if he ever decides to vague post me again, I will, uh, I'll, I'll make sure I'll just reach out to you directly and just, you know. Go with it, so, yeah. There's a Lauryn Hill song that can go along with that as well. There you go. There you go. Right on. All right. So, Mr. Betcher, uh, tell, tell us a little bit about uh, how people can find you and uh, what you do with LogMD. What do I do with the LogMD? Well, I, um, I wrote a program that, helps you um, figure out how to do uh, Windows logging uh, better. Um, you know, I'm sure there's some compliance requirements around that, right? Um, to record the stuff and the things. Right. And, it, and it also helps you with um, uh, proving, like for, for example, if you get ransomware, HIPAA says that, um, you know, unless you can prove that you didn't lose any data, then that's a breach, right? right. So 
uh, it helps you to do those things, right? So that will put you in a better position when it comes to compliance. And uh, so that's, that's my tool along with Michael Golf, And um, uh, we you know, are the purveyors of uh, LogMD and you can find it at log-md.com. Excellent. All right. And of course, everybody's been seeing your Twitter handle uh, going across the screen on, on Twitter, uh, on Twitch. Uh, so uh, you're Betcher Pwned, B-O-E-T-T-C-H-E-R-P-W-N-E-D. Uh, Miss Berlin, who will be back hopefully next weekend. I'd like to do a show with her next weekend, even though we'll, we'll probably use this as a one and a two parter, um, just to, to get her into the, to the Twitch and to introduce her to the world. Uh, you can find her at info sister, I N F O S Y S T I R. Uh, you can follow the podcast at breaksec, B R A K E S E C. And I am on Twitter at Brian break, B R Y A N B R A K E. Um, just for everybody who's listening to the audio podcast, if you've come this far, thank you, because this is usually where everybody probably shuts off on the audio podcast because we, we tend to, you know, introduce ourselves or, or, or go out. The Twitch stream is going to be around for the foreseeable future, and we're going to do a lot of events on it. Um, I have a mentee. Uh, his name is AJ. He is working as a paramedic EMT in the Chicago area and is looking to take his master's degree when he come, gets out in December of this year and pivot into InfoSec. And he has asked me, and I found him through the Black Girls Hack Slack, which is one of the uh, organizations that uh, uh, our umbrella corporation, the International uh, InfoSec Education Foundation, has set up uh, scholarships to help people get vouchers for Security Plus certifications uh, and and help to get to conferences so that everybody can be exposed to InfoSec. Everybody should be able to be exposed to InfoSec if they so choose. Um, so AJ and myself are going to have some regular vignettes on here on the uh, on the sli- on the Twitch, uh, going through Try Hack Me. We're going to go through some of the Burp Suite Academy stuff. Uh, one of our one of our uh, content creators, Wimmery, is already doing some of those on her own channel. If you go to Twitch.tv/slash Wimmery, W H I M M E R Y. Uh, you can go and check out what she's been doing over there. She also does some gaming, uh, like you know most Twitch folk, uh, and uh, but she also does Burp Sweet Academy stuff. And so we're going to go through some try hack me. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna get some skills. We're gonna up skills. So if you are interested in uh, doing some try hack me or Pen Tester Labs or Vuln Hub or anything, if you have an idea on on things that we can do on here, CTFs, you know, uh, over the wire, under the wire stuff if you want to do those uh, old school war, uh, war games if you just want to sit around and do regex golf like what Ms. mr betcher showed me alf.nu i think is alf.nu which is regex golf it's infuriating i will tell you right now it is it is awful um but you will learn how to do regexes pretty easily with that uh, by the time you're done so but if you have ideas on how, on what we can do and spend a couple hours every week doing it my next month of March is going to be doing at least an hour a day of content, whether it be me reading the news and talking about various facets of things uh, or going through the attack, defend. And I think MITRE just came out with a new framework called Engage. So if you are interested in, you know, discussing some of that, um, you know, consider this to be an educational font of uh, the place to be, you know, if, if, you know, if you're looking to upscale or you're just looking to hang out and, and talk about all things security, um, you know, we, we would definitely love to do that. So, um, tell your friends because we want to grow the community and, uh, to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to, to get involved. Um, and, uh, we're, we're looking to expand our relationship with black girls hack if at all possible. And with other groups that are, uh, infosec related or security related or, you know, DevOps and programming and PM related. So we're definitely, uh, pushing, uh, you know, we're, we're definitely pushing an, an education agenda here, which seems to be in short supply on Twitch. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, talking about gaming and esports. There's really not a lot here going on with education wise uh, for security. So we are we're definitely uh, very niche, but uh, we hope to have some fun doing it, too. So um, tell your friends, you know, push us out on all your social media platforms, uh, you know, listen to the podcast, tell your people about the podcast, upvote us on, uh, Apple podcasts, Google play elsewhere. And, uh, you know, LinkedIn, cause you know, we 
we, we sometimes neglect LinkedIn, but um, yeah, we, we, we really appreciate the help. And uh, we just hit affiliate status because of la yesterday's Sunflower Con, which I don't know is uh, how big a deal that is. I actually have to read more into it. Um, but it sounds like we'll be somewhat self-sustaining with all of the uh, the revenue that we get from this. So um, do appreciate everybody for 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 helping out with that. Uh, we do thank our Patreon donors, the tip jar that you see on the crawl. If you go to uh, breaksec.com forward slash BDS Patreon, uh, you can help donate some money to the tip jar, which will go to you know just maintenance and upkeep, the Zoom we use, domain hosting, Libsyn for uh, distribution. Uh, and, you know, helping out, uh, you know, just time and effort of me and Mr. Betcher, Ms. Berlin, and all of our moderators in our Slack putting, uh, making community work and, and, and making everything work. So um, hope, hope you'll find, uh, find, a, find time to make some love there either by, you know, uh, uh, you know educating and communicating the, us to your friends and colleagues or, uh, you know, giving us a little something in tip jar. So appreciate everybody for doing that.